And as a small community rocked by a deranged killer comes together to remember the 18 lives lost in Maine, new details are revealed about the shooter's possible motive, his final moments, and the note he left behind. C.B. Cotton is live in Lisbon Falls, Maine, where that vigil's just been held. C.B.? Hi, Charlie. Yeah, those who were killed were simply out trying to have fun during the busy work week. Instead, they were gunned down. Tonight, the vigil happening behind me starts the healing process for this community. Lost a lot of people, and um, it's just, I don't know what to think about it yet. It doesn't seem, I, I'm waiting to wake up and pinch me, I'm dreaming. This, is, this, uh, this, I, this could not have happened here. And not in a million years. On Friday evening, police finding the body of the accused mass shooter, Robert Card, with a self-inflicted gunshot wound at a recycling center where he used to work. Investigators say the facility was initially searched and cleared, but the business owner contacted them again, asking officers to search other trailers in an overflow parking lot. A tactical team finding Card with two firearms behind the sliding door of an unlocked trailer. Federal law enforcement sources previously told Fox that Card an Army reservist was advised to undergo mental health treatment sometime this summer based on his behavior. Local law enforcement telling us today they're not privy to that information and they don't know whether he was ever forced to get treatment. But now officers are digging into his history of mental health challenges. The mental health aspect of this, there's a piece of that uh, where there's paranoia, uh, there's some conspiracy theorist uh, piece that I think uh, what I've read and what I've seen is that uh, the individual felt like uh, people were talking about him. We also learned today that the shooter legally purchased his firearms, some of them recently. Now it'll be on an autopsy to determine how long Card had been in the trailer before he was found. Charlie, processing of the crime scene is going to continue throughout this weekend. Back to you. Thank you so much, CB. Uh, you know, Molly, uh, you just returned from, from up there and, uh, you know, listening to that report, uh, you really do get a sense of how surreal it must, it must be. You know, you see this sort of thing on TV and you, you would never think it would happen in your community. And these people are just completely rocked by it because suddenly it becomes very real. Yeah. And, you know, being there yesterday, you, you kind of feel like your heart is still there because as, as it went on, there was still a killer on the loose for a period of time, and that was a big priority in making sure people understood that and were staying safe in their homes. Uh, but then you begin to see the, the faces of the victims and to hear about the people and how they're affected in this small city, some 35,000 people, less than that, and it impacted the surrounding communities, and you, and you just heard the individual there saying, you know, pinch me, I'm going to wake yeah. up. And for a lot of these <clears throat> folks who've lost loved ones, you know, you can talk about the healing and the strength of the community, and that's all true. And these communities in Maine are beautiful and, and strong, and, and, and people love each other. But some people lost entire friend groups. There were four members of the local deaf community who lost Joshua, Billy, Steve, and Brian. And so th that's going to be part of this, is that this is a huge community loss, intimate, tight night groups, people that hung out together. And, and that's just what I think about today. Now that, now that we know that the, kill, that the uh, killer is deceased, there's still going to be a, a lot of grief. What do, what do we know about the note that he left? So uh, the, essentially, it's, some, it's been sometimes described in the media as a suicide note, but authorities have pushed back on that a little bit uh, in that it, that it had uh, the tone of someone who wasn't going to be there any longer. And yet now we know that Robert Card's body has been found. They believe it was a self-inflicted a gun wound. The note left what law enforcement says is, is, is common in suicide notes, some information that a family member might need, how to get into a cell phone, how to access uh, money, that sort of thing. And essentially the tone was that the, I'm not going to be here anymore. Right. So of course that is how things ended up. You know, Jason, before we get into the sort of political sideshow that always seems to come out of these things, um, you know, there's a lot of talk about the fact that, you know, because he was not in, because he was not involuntarily uh, held because of his psychiatric problems, that that that, that for, did not did not uh, trigger the yellow flag law. But let's listen to the uh, uh, main commissioner of public safety on that. In this scenario, uh, we have not seen to this point. I have not seen to this point 
that Mr. Card was forcibly committed for treatment. And if that didn't happen, uh, then the next check, you could go into a, a firearms dealer uh, who does all of their work, and the background check is not going to ping like this individual is prohibited. It, it does, Jason, kind of underscore the problems with these so-called red flag or, in Maine's case, the yellow flag laws. Well, there's been a push by sportsmen uh, over the last couple of years to what's called Fix NICS, the National Instant Background Check, because I don't think the commissioner necessarily, and it, it takes time to go through this, okay, but you, there are certain times in which law enforcement can go to the court. You're talking about taking away somebody's constitutional rights, but if you're threatening uh, a base that you may do harm to it, why isn't that a trigger enough? I mean, it just makes me mad that somebody of such you know, mental um, stress is somehow able to access a law, uh, access a, a, a firearm legally. I just, I own guns. I have guns. I concealed carry permit. My wife has a concealed carry permit. I have rifles. I have shotguns. I've got, I've got handguns. Uh, I don't want more laws on me. But for somebody who's threatening law enforcement and a base Come on, folks. There's got to be something that triggers, hey, we're, they're going to need to interview this person before also, he buys more guns. Yeah, and, and, and of course, if you're making threats against anyone's life uh, or making threats about a military base, I would assume that's a felony. And in terms of, you know, if you want to do red flag laws, the greatest red flag law ever invented is a felony, felony conviction. And I can tell you, when I was in Congress with John Ratcliffe and Trey Gowdy and some other people who care about the Second Amendment, we pushed the administration all the time. Show me your U.S. attorneys. Show me your prosecuting gun cases, because these are not popular cases to go after. They're hard to win, but they're almost never prosecuted. If you don't prosecute them, guess what? Then they're not in the system. Right. Yeah. So I'm not trying to draw conclusions in this. There's still people fighting fighting for their life in the hospital. Right. That community well, is still mourning. It's but you got we got to figure this out. No, the, the most disgusting part of all of it is of course the immediate uh, desire by some politicians mm -hmm. to take and exploit a tragedy like this and make it for political, you know, to try to uh, get political points off of it. Listen to what uh, Vice President Kamala Harris said uh, about uh, about the gun laws in Austria, uh, Australia. Gun violence has terrorized and traumatized so many of our communities in this country. And let us be clear, it does not have to be this way, as our friends in Australia have demonstrated. So Australia confiscated yep. everyone's guns. This is nuts, and she's choosing, as, as Jason says, a moment where people are still fighting for their lives to, to try to score political points off of it. I will give her this. Thank you, Vice President Kamala Harris, for being honest with us, because so many Democrats will not. They will not say that their ultimate desire is to confiscate weapons. They'll say that they want common sense gun reform, and then they really can't point to the common sense gun reform that's going to solve any of these tragedies, because time and time again, as what it looks like here, it's somebody who fell through the cracks. It's this agency is not talking to this agency. This military base had concerns. This family had concerns. Nobody is communicating with one another. It seems to be that someone once again fell through the cracks, and there is no law you can put on the books if bureaucrats and, and people are not doing their jobs or their due diligence. You you can pass as many laws as you want outside of confiscation, which is never going to work in the United States. It's not going to work if people are not doing their jobs. And law-abiding gun owners should not be to blame and should not be caught up in all of this because certain people are not doing their jobs and people are once again falling right. through the cracks. So, Molly, and I'm sure this is not a discussion at the top of minds of people in Maine. Well, it, it's funny, Representative Jared Golden, who is the second congressional district up there in Maine, a Democrat that kind of suits the district in the same way that, say, S Senator Manchin suits West Virginia, fairly conservative or, or moderate Democrat for that area, has military experience himself. He has now shifted where he stands on assault weapons, saying, I've opposed efforts to ban deadly weapons of war like the assault rifle, rifle used to carry out this crime. This is what he said in the news conference in Lewiston. The time has now come for me to take responsibility for this failure, which is why I now call on the United States Congress to ban assault rifles. So I, I couldn't call him a uh, that he's taking advantage of a moment to get something done. I feel like this has hit his heart very hard. Right. 
Uh, and then following that statement, though, the main GOP chairman uh, that Joel um, Stetkis says, you know, expressing their condolences, of course, as well, but also saying that we'll not play politics as this tragedy unfolds and families grieve. But when the time comes to defend the inalienable rights of the people of Maine, we'll be ready. So there is that sense that the, the same battle continues to take place. Well, and of course, the important thing to remember here is that 18 people lost their lives, uh, 13 more were wounded, and the idea that people are going to exploit this for politics is just absolutely appalling. Um, but thanks. Hey, Sean Hannity here. Hey, click here to subscribe to Fox News' YouTube page and catch our hottest interviews and most compelling analysis. You will not get it anywhere else.